Hello, 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 everybody, and welcome to the Nimble Urban Survivor. I'm your host, Nick Catelli. Hope you're having a good month, good day, good year, good something, because we had a dramatic show today. I'm not going to lie, I'm using my dramatic voice because we have a very, very dramatic show. And it's a very serious show. And this one is very near and dear to me, to my heart, because I did survive this, you know? And so I don't want to say I have, like, PTSD in the middle. Like, I don't wake up in a cold sweat because of this, but this did happen to me. Um, and it was very tough. So let's read the submission. Today's submission comes from, and I'm going to keep them anonymous. You know, normally we, we say their first name and you guys are able to find these people and, and heckle them and stuff, but we're going to keep this one anonymous. I'm going to give it a little bit of a dramatic effect. Okay. <clears throat> so <clears throat> dramatic effect. Here we go. Dear Nicholas, dear Dear Nicholas and the Nimble Urban Survivor, the greatest show in the history of shows, I implore you to teach people about the art of how to survive being a substitute teacher. I tried it. I wanted to be an educator. I wanted to educate the young minds of America and help them excel in their, to their careers in education and smarts, but they crushed my soul. They crushed my soul as I tried to be a substitute teacher, and I ended up going into a career of insurance selling. To this day, my soul is still crushed by what I had to deal in substitute teaching. So how do you survive being a substitute teacher? And that's a tough one, because that's a tough, pardon my French, fucking job. Okay, I did the research. And substitute teacher, if you didn't know this, in America, I don't know what it's like in other countries, but in America, number one toughest job, substitute teacher. Number two toughest job, poop extractor. You know, like a scientist has to get like poop out of people and then, you know, like look through it and stuff like that to see if your body's healthy. That's number two. You know, I would have thought it had been like a correctional facilities officer, you know, where the convicts are like spitting on you and trying to shank you and shit. No, 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 no. That's less dangerous than being a substitute teacher at a school. And this one is near and dear to my heart, like I said at the beginning of the episode, because I did this. And it was tough, man. It was emotionally tough. Because you literally think of like a substitute teacher. You're like, well, I'm, I'm just a glorified babysitter. I'm going to go in there, babysit the kids, collect my check, go home, you know, watch some cubby baseball, bada boom, bada bing, bada boom. It's not that fucking easy. I'm going to tell you that right now. But as always on the show, you know, we have to talk about why it's important to survive being a substitute teacher. Because we do. Like, I, I, I totally agree. Like, we need substitute teachers. Because teachers, man, they have such a hard job. They do. They do. Because I know, like, parents out there, parents are kind of dumb. I'm not going to lie. A lot of dumb parents out there. Because they think for a teacher, here's how a parent thinks for a teacher. Like, well, my kid goes to school, and then the teacher teaches them stuff. They remember it, and then you go on to the next grade. And that's how teachers work. No, 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 no. I'm going to back you up right there. Let me tell you something. I feel like 99.3% of a teacher's job is literally keeping the kids in line. Because the kids are just so undisciplined nowadays. Like, they don't listen. You know, they're not focused. They don't listen to you. They disrespect you left and right. And then if you do something to them, they just threaten to sue you and get a lawyer. So I feel for teachers. Teachers, number one, they're so important because if we didn't have them, our kids would be idiots. And number two, like, they deserve to be making at least, like, right out of the gate, a teacher should be making, like, six figures a day. Okay? That's what they should be making because of the shit they have to put up with it's a tough job and we need substitute teachers because you know obviously your teachers will get burnt out and they're like i just need a sub just to come in and like take the shit that i have to deal with on a normal basis so then the teachers can have like their three-day weekends and their vacations and you know get some time off and things like because they need that they need to like re-energize you know after all of like the emotional trauma they take from these kids because if we don't have the substitute teachers and then the teachers are like, I'm done, I'm done. 
then the kids are going to get stupider and we're looking at an apocalyptic event and, and pretty much we're just going to evolve right back into being a caveman because people are going to have to like homeschool, right? And you can see with COVID, like people don't want to homeschool their kids. I like that even people just admit that they're stupid when it comes to homeschooling. Like, well, I mean, I'm going to homeschool my kid, but I'm not going to lie. He's going to be an idiot after I teach him. I mean, I like that there's not any, there's not one lick of confidence uh, from these parents during COVID who have to like stay home and, and, and teach their kids. They're just admitting like, no, my kid's going to be dumber. So he's probably going to have to repeat kindergarten, first grade and second grade. You know, he's going to be one of those kids in high school who's like old enough to buy alcohol for all the other kids. will be like 25. Um, and that's a shame. So that's why we need substitute teachers because substitute teachers are definitely like the ones who come in when the teacher just needs a break and just absorbs all of the shit that the kids like throw at you. Because substitute teaching has changed. It has evolved. Because when I was a kid, I was a 90s kid. And when the substitute teacher came in, they would usually like, we'd watch a movie and we would just watch the movie. And that's it. Like no one would fuck with the, the sub because we're like, we're going to watch TV. Boom. There was that mutual respect of like, we get to watch a movie. We won't mess with you. The sub will just sit there. Everyone's happy, right? It's a free class. We're not learning. We're watching TV, right? Doesn't work like that today. Okay. Even as a sub, even if you brought a movie in, the kids, all they want to do is just fuck with you. They just want to fuck with you. That's what they want to do. And it happened to me. Now, obviously, like, we have to survive this. The teachers need a break. We can't de-evolve back into caveman because then the world would just be in, in, in total anarchy. I don't even know if that's the right term. So we need the substitute teachers because we need the real teachers. Okay, who should be making six figures a year, by the way. I, I said that on my show, and, and I, 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 I totally agree with that. So let me tell you about my experience being a substitute teacher. It was back, I just graduated college. Obviously, if you don't know, I have a Bachelor's of Fine Arts in Acting Directing, and I was still finding my way, you know, as an artist. So I had a family member uh, who was a teacher, and they said, Nick, you should just be a substitute teacher. It's easy money. You just sit there, you babysit the kids. And it was good money. I'm not going to lie. It was good money. It's like one of those get-rich-quick schemes. You're like, I'm just going to babysit those kids, and I'm going to be making, like, oodles of cash. Because just, like, you could make, like, up to, like, $1,000 a week if you worked, like, every day of the week being a substitute teacher. And, you know, my mindset at first was like, well, dude, I'm just going to substitute elementary school, you know, because I'm a guy, and... I'm kind of fun. I admit I'm kind of a fun dude. Um, and the kids, you know, the good thing about elementary school is, like, the kids still respect you because they're, like, still young. They still listen to you. And, you know, you read them books, and they have nap time, and they drink milk. And, and it's great, right? No. When I applied to be a substitute teacher, uh, they, put it, they put me in the middle school and high school bracket because I was a guy. Because I don't know about you, but I, I feel like men in the elementary school scene – aren't always well accepted, you know? Don't see a lot of guy kindergarten teachers out there. I'm not going to lie. I didn't see my first guy teacher until I was in middle school. All the way up until like sixth grade, I had all female teachers. Uh, I don't know why it's like that. Maybe a lot of guys just aren't applying to be like kindergarten teachers. I don't know why, though. It, it seems like it'd be a super, super fun job. I would have done that. Obviously, they stuck me in the uh, middle school high school room, right? So as a substitute teacher, you have to go through like a one day of training. And it's really funny because they just teach you these like generic techniques on how to discipline the kids. And they literally use like an old school technique of like, all right, so if the kids are getting rowdy, just start counting backwards from five to one. You know, you're like five, four, remember, sit down kids, three, sit down kids, two, one, and I'm just like, oh, it's just that easy. Oh, well, this is going to be such a blast. It's just that easy. I count backwards from five. I flash the lights a couple of times. And I'm pretty sure the 18-year-olds are going to respect me. Wrong. I'm not going to lie. I don't know who designed the this is how you have to be a substitute teacher class. It, it's fucking horribly wrong. Horribly wrong. Who's ever teaching that class has never actually subbed a class of middle schoolers in high schoolers before. But it was funny because these were the techniques that they had to like discipline the kids. 
And I already kind of knew, I was like, well, I don't think that's going to work because I don't think I would have ever listened to that at all. So I did the class, and then you have to do a background check because I got to, you know, make sure you're not like a pedophile or something like that. And I think I had to get like a tuberculosis test because obviously medieval diseases are still a thing in schools for some reason. And here's how it works, right? You don't know what your schedule is going to be like for the week. So they will call you, I kid you not, they will call you the day of at like 5 a.m. to come in to teach the class, right? They'll, they'll call you up and they'll be like, hey, Nick, it's blah, blah, blah. We're at so-and-so uh, high school and we need you to fill in for a math class. And then you have like a split second to decide of like, yes, I'm going to do it or no, I'm not going to do it. It's kind of like in one of those movies, like a detective movie where you're like slightly hung over and the phone rings and you pick it up and be like, yeah. This is Nick. And they're like, Nick, we need you. We need you to sub a class at a high school. And like, all right, I'll be there in a second. And you like hang up the phone. And you like sit on the edge of the bed. And like the fan is like slowly going in the ceiling. And I'm just like, ah, I got to teach these fucking kids today. How am I going to teach these fucking kids? So you're like smoking a cigarette in the shower. It's like a the noir. What is that? The detective noir kind of thing. Detective noir. And that's how it is. And then you like, you know, get up and shower as quickly as you can, put on something that's presentable because you're not allowed to wear jeans as a teacher. And then you you go, you check in at the office, and then you go to the classroom and you only have like literally five minutes to figure out just what the hell you're doing for the day. And the teacher might like leave you some notes or something like that. I pretty much most of the time would just throw the notes out and just be kind of like, dude, do whatever you want to do, right? So I figured out that that doesn't work, okay? And it was an awful experience. And I will say, like, high school kids, yeah, they're not as bad, but middle school kids, man, they are awful. They are so awful. And it was just a constant battle. And thankfully, I was young. I was only, like, 22 at the time. Um, So I could, like, take the beats. Like, I had the energy to, like, take a beating and get hit. And I will say, I, I really do believe that like substitute teaching is definitely like a young kid's game. Like don't be a substitute teacher once you hit the age of like 20, 25 and up. You know, it's like being a porn star. You know, once you're in your mid 20s, retire from the gig. Because the funny thing is, is like you would always meet a lot of like super older substitute teachers. Like it'd be like an 86 year old man and he'd be like, I wanted to be a sub. I used to be a teacher of economics at Yale, and now I thought I just to stay busy, I'm going to be a substitute teacher. And then I'm like, dude, man, you, I'm not going to lie, like, these kids might stress you out to the point of, like, you might die on the job. You might die on the, but that might be his thing, like, maybe he's like, that's how I want to go out, like, I want to go out being a substitute teacher and battling these kids. But it's a weird thing because it's either like your uh, substitutes are usually in their 20s or it's like there's this huge gap and then they're in their like 70s and up. But my experience as a sub, it was awful because I was. I was just constantly fighting the kids. If you make one little mistake, they will call you out on it. So it's, it's, it's terrible. It's awful. So on today's show, obviously, how to survive being a substitute teacher, there's not really any steps to it, but I want to give you a few like tips or scenarios that you need to do because at the end of the day, you want to like earn the respect of the class. You want to earn their attention because obviously if you go in and like kick a desk over and you get like really aggressive and really mean, dude, they will throw that shit right back at you and then if you try to do that thing like in the movies like remember in the robin williams movie where he like tried to connect with the class it's like oh captain my captain you know you like try to have like those heartfelt like teen movie comedy connect doesn't work none of that stuff works i hate those movies by the way where it's like the teacher goes and it's like you know mr catelli he was a down and out teacher and he got to teach a class in south central and these kids were dumb. But then he connected with his heart and he teached them how to do algebra. Doesn't happen like that. That's all fantasy. Like what you see in the movies when like the teacher like connects with like the kids who are selling crack and Robin doesn't happen. 
I'm going to tell you right now, I tried that technique. Does not happen, okay? So <clears throat> you can't really connect with the kids because they'll just take advantage of you. You can't come in as an asshole because then the kids will just throw it right back at you. And then they'll threaten to sue you. I think I was threatened to uh, a lawsuit, I think, twice. Um, one girl literally told me her mommy would sue me. And here's my response back to her was, I just asked her if her mom was hot. Um, so we don't really have steps on how to survive being a substitute teacher. But let's talk about a few scenarios, right? Number one is, I call this the pick out the week one. Okay, so what this is going to be, and this happened to me, uh, and I caught on that this technique really works well, is you want to pick out the one kid who you're just going to make the sole focus of your jokes, right? It's like when you're a stand-up comedian and you find that person in the front row and you're just ripping on them for like 10, 15, 20. Your whole set is just making fun of this person, but it works. And the audience is like completely with you. This kind of can really apply to when you're like a substitute teacher. And I'll give you an example. One time I went into a room and it was like sixth graders. And I remember the kids were being like super rowdy. And then I was like taking attendance. And I accidentally called this one kid, Michelle, when his name was Mitchell, but it was spelled like Michelle. I was like, look, tell your parents not to be drinking when they're naming you after you were born, okay? And I called him Michelle, and everybody laughed at him, and it was great. And this kid was a dick to begin with, so it shut him up right away when he became the butt of my jokes. And then I literally had earned the respect of the class because I was laughing with the class at this kid. And then from there on, the class was with me. They listened to me because they knew that if they got out of line that I would take that humor and I would reflect it onto them. Because the one thing I learned about middle school kids or high school kids, obviously their egos, you know, are, you know, gentle and they want to be the popular kids and all that stuff. But if you just make fun of them and everyone laughs at them and, and these kids are like, man, that teacher is like really funny because he made fun of, you know, little Billy. Yeah. You've earned the class that way. Now, here's a rookie mistake. Don't come in there with, like, stupid jokes trying to, like, make them laugh. You have to make fun of one of the kids. You have to, okay? And it's got to be clever. I don't think it's got to be, like, R-rated or PG. It's definitely got to be a little bit PG-13. But this Mitchell, Michelle kid, I just kept acting like I kept calling him Michelle. And I was like, oh, <laughs> sorry there, Michelle. Oh, I mean Mitchell. <laughs> and all the kids would laugh at him. And I was like, you know, you do actually kind of come across as a Michelle. Uh, were you on uh, Full House? And then they were just laughing, and it was fucking hilarious. I'm not going to lie. I wish I would have, like, recorded that set and sent it to some, like, talent agents and managers because I'd probably be repped by, like, CAA right now and have, like, my own Madison Square Garden stand-up comedy hour just for ripping on this kid. And again, I didn't feel bad because this kid was a dick. So that's the thing, too, is, like, in this scenario, and what I like to call the heckling the audience scenario, you want to find the asshole kid in the group. And trust me, here's the good thing about kids. The asshole kid will make themselves present. Like, the split second you enter the room, they'll make themselves present, right? Because they want to be the funny kid, the outlandish kid. And once you start dominating him with your comedy and he's no longer the alpha comedy person in the room or girl you know I don't want to be sexist but here's the reality of things the boys are always shitheads the girls are always super super nice so the girls are always super super sweet I never had an issue with a female student at all like the boys are always the dickheads but you trust me like you will figure out which one is the like wannabe alpha comedy guy and you crush his alpha comediness with your alpha comediness now if you're not a comedian because i know you're not a comedian probably like me uh you can always sign up for classes take classes you know figure it out watch some youtube videos of like comedians that got a little bite to them you know like Chappelle, uh chris hart um, George Carlin, you know, things like that. I wouldn't go with the lighthearted comedians, you know, like Jim Gaffigan, you know, Sebastian Mascalco. I don't think that humor really works. You know, the kids, it's got to be a little bit edgy. Definitely got to make fun of them. So I think that scenario works because I've done it and it works great. Because once the kids find out that you are now the alpha comedian in the classroom, they will listen to you. So that's scenario one. Scenario two is have a really depressing backstory, right? Because the other thing, too, I found about kids is they're very attuned 
and empathetic sometimes, okay? <clears throat> and this happened to me because I remember I had rolled my ankle, okay? And I had some crutches. Uh, and I was moving around on crutches and stuff. And they called me in and I like, like had my, and my leg was like super wrapped up. It probably was more wrapped up than what it normally should be. It probably looks like I got my like leg blown out or something like that. So I came in the room with my crutches and my leg, you know, wrapped up all the way up to my knee. So it was a definite overkill. Okay. Cause I'm not, I'm, I'm not a doctor. I don't know how to wrap stuff. And I remember the kids were very focused on it. And this was like high school kids. And one kid was like, whoa, dude, like, what happened to your leg? And I remember, without even thinking, I was like, dude, I was alley racing in my car, totally crashed, messed up my leg. All the kids were like, whoa. So that's how you earn their respect, too. Obviously, we talked about the comedy aspect. This is what I like to call the, like, extreme method where you're like a daredevil or you race cars or you do MMA fighting on the weekends like something where the kids are like wow this guy's like an aggressive alpha male and once I had told them that I'd messed up my leg in like an aggressive MMA style driving thing they were hooked and they were disciplined because here's what thing here's what goes on in their minds okay and I'm not going to say this but I will say this I am smarter than probably every child psychiatrist out there, okay? Once the kids think, oh my God, this guy's kind of dangerous, they're gonna listen to you because they're gonna be kind of scared of you. And that's what you want. You want a little bit of a, a touch of fear, but be confident, right? Because here's the rookie mistake is people come in and they try to be like really intense and really scary. Kids can pull up, you know, kids are very attuned to bullshit, all right? But you really gotta sell this one. You know, I had the crutches and the leg, and I didn't, like, get really low in and, like, gritty into it. Like, I could have been like, yeah, I was driving my car, and I crashed it just to fucking crash it. No, I played it off cool and cocky, because you got to remember, kids are attracted to cool and cocky, all right? I went in, and I was like, yeah, man, you know, no big deal. I was racing my car. I put it in the fourth gear. I spinned out. And my leg just went right through the fucking dashboard, dude. But it happens, man. I patched it up and I did like two more races because that's just life, man. You know, and the kids were just like hooked on it. And that's awesome. So I guess that scenario would be is be the extremist, be the daredevil, but be confident about your daredevilness. You know, play it off. And the kids will just, they will buy into it. They will eat into it. And then they'll just listen to anything that you have to say. Because part of them is kind of scared of you. Because they're like, dude, this guy's extreme, man. I don't want to set this guy off. Also, like, I'm hooked on his stories. Because, you know, like, kids play Grand Theft Auto and they're they're hooked on, you know, violence and things like that. So you kind of want to play into that. I think the best technique, too, is you can always just use, like, a scenario from a video game. That might be best. But don't do, like, Super Mario. Don't come in and be like, yeah, I hurt on my leg, you know, saving on my girlfriend, the princess from the, you know, I think they'll, they'll, you know, that's a lie. But if you're like, yeah, man, I was downtown and this guy tried to pull me out of my car and tried to drive off and I beat the shit out of him, took his money, hopped in the car, drove off. I had two stars of cops after me and then I hid for a while. You know, that's Grand Theft Auto. That might be a little bit extreme, but you know, the kids don't know that. Um, but that's a good technique is like, you know, steal something from a video game. And I think that would work well. You know, the kids are very, you know, uh, addicted to action and things like that. I blame that on video games, movies, but we already talked about that. Now, scenario three is going to be like the complete opposite of that. Because obviously we feed on kids, you know, thirst for violence and extreme sports. But now let's talk on their hearts a little bit. Because kids nowadays, you know, they, 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 they there's an emotional touch there, but you really have to connect with it. And I know like in the movies, they make this fantasy of like, I really connect with it because I respect you and love you. No, 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 no. You want to create a very deep, I would say empathetic scenario that the kids are going to feed off of. And I'll give you an example. One time I was teaching a high school class and uh, I remember I walked in the room and I already knew. I already knew, I was like, this is going to be a battle. This is going to be a battle. 
And I remember I put my hand on my forehead and I was like scratching my head because I was like, oh, I can't do this today. I think it was also slightly hungover. And I was going to ask the girl out at Starbucks, but I totally didn't do it. I blew it because I didn't think my coffee was manly enough. I had ordered a fucking skinny French vanilla latte with low fat milk. And I was like, that's so not alpha male. And <clears throat> I remember I'm like rubbing my head because I'm like, this is going to be a day. And I remember this girl, she's like, Mr. Catelli, is everything okay? And all the kids started to get quiet because they heard her ask that question. And then they were focused on me. And I was just like, oh, my God, the kids, they feel slightly bad for me because they see that I'm, like, sad. So I literally look up at them and I go, yeah, guys, I, um, uh, my wife left me. I didn't even, like, it just came out. I, mean, I was like, my wife just left me. And all the kids are like, oh, my God. And they were hooked. That's the one thing I also learned about kids is, you know, a lot of kids nowadays have a lot of divorced parents. A lot of divorced parents. I'm surprised parents, you know, are even together for like three or four years, man. They get so divorced. So we had a lot of divorced kids in the group. And we ended up having like a circle chat about, you know, my fake marriage that had just ended. And we had this really in-depth discussion about, you know, divorces. And they felt really bad for me, you know. Uh, but you got to keep it really, really natural. Guys, don't come in there and say, like, you just lost your family in a gas explosion near a Dairy Queen. That's going to be complete bullshit. It's got to be subtle. And you really have to get the kids to fish for it, okay? Don't do that thing, because here's the rookie mistake, is, like, people will walk in the room and be like, oh, man, hey, everybody, I'm having a bad day because my dog just, you know, blew up in my arms. Well, you know, they don't, they know that's bullshit. You got to fish it, right? You got to fish for it. So come in. Look a little distraught. If you're wearing a tie, maybe loosen the tie. You know, mess your hair up a little bit. When you come in the room, it's almost like you want to play it like you have like a hangover off of Zima because, you know, Zima is an awful drink and they stopped making it like in the early 90s, but you tried it on a dare and now you're hungover. That's kind of the look you want to go for. And, you you know, you just want to keep kind of doing it, hunch over a little bit because one of the kids will be like, Mr. Catelli, what's wrong? And that's when you can feed into it. You know, so I found that was really good. I think divorce works really well uh, because a lot of kids nowadays, sadly, have divorced parents and have step parents. I, 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 it's just like a common thing. People are just getting married. They're having a kid. And then they go off and get step. I, you know, it's sad, but, you know, that's that's 2021. So I would say go the divorce route obviously. Now, don't go in there as like an older person and be like, you know, my parents just got a divorce. That's a rookie mistake. Like if you come in and you're like in your 40s or 50s or 60s or 100s, and you're like, uh, hey guys, having a bad day. My parents just got a divorce. Because obviously they're gonna be like, Why, how does this 80 year old man still have parents? Unless his parents like gave birth to him when they were both like 10 years old. So don't do that. Just say that like, you know, your wife divorced you, your husband divorced you. Um, I feel like those are really, really good scenarios. You know, uh, they ran off with somebody else. That also works too. Now, if you're older in this scenario, like if you're in your 70s or your 80s, I would go the widower route. You know, I would just say like, I just lost my wife. Um, and this is the only way I can connect with human beings. That's a really good one uh, to pull over on the kids. I feel like they would be really empathetic to that. You know, it's like, hey, just lost old Herbie yesterday. We made love and went to sleep, and I didn't know that that would be the last time that we made love. And now he's gone, so I decided to be a substitute teacher just so I can still be around humans because I have no reason to be on this earth. You know, if you do something like that, um, I don't really, you know, really, really connect with the kids and, and they'll be, you know, super, super empathetic to you. I think that's a really, really good scenario. So remember, just to recap on that one, if you're young, make it somebody just left you. If you're older, make it someone that you were married to just died. You know, uh, worst case scenario and how that can backfire, though, uh, and I've seen this happen, is the kids will then try to push off their divorced parent onto you. I don't want to say this happened to me, but it did happen to me. Uh, there was a little girl, and she was like, Mr. Catelli, you know, my mom's also divorced. If you ever wanted, I, I, I could give you her number, and you guys could get together and and, and talk about it. Um, 
you know, I get that it's like it would be easy to fall into that trap because dating is so hard nowadays with like, you know, the Internet ruining it. And I know a lot of you are probably lonely out there and it would probably go that route. But here's the thing. If you go that route and you start dating one of the student's parents, um, that's not going to be good, even though it, it, it's a it's a bona fide way that you know that you're already on a good foot. Like, cause if someone's like kid was like, you should date my teacher, the parent, you know, obviously like loves their kid. They're going to listen to their kid. So it's like when you win over the dad, when you're dating his daughter, like you're already like, boom, you're, you, you have a pretty good chance of probably getting laid on the first date. I'm not going to lie, but don't fall into it because then you have to keep the story going. And then you're going to have to create like a whole divorced ex-wife and you're going to have to hire an actress and a backstory. And that's a whole thing. We could spend like an hour talking about this scenario. So I'm going to stop you right there. Don't date the student's divorced parents. Just don't do it. I don't care how hot they are. I don't care if they have a lot of money or they drive a Chevy. Just don't do it. Okay? All right. So let's move on to scenario four. And this one's a pretty cut and dry scenario. This is called Hint of a Porn Star. Okay? And I'll give you a true story here. Obviously, I am not a porn star. Uh, at all and if I was I, I would definitely tell you guys um, but there was this story it was out of the Midwest uh, I won't name the city it rhymes with St. Louis and a teacher at a high school had done porn in the 80s like she did some like late 80s porn right and then you know she made her money got her teaching degree and then she was teaching I think like English or something at a high school Right. So, you know, nowadays, these kids, you know how it is with kids is, you know, back in the 80s, I don't think a lot of porn stars had like big porn star names. I think they use their, you know, their real names. Now, you know, they have like porn star names. There's like, I'm, you know, Dick's Enormous. My name is Clint the Clitoris. You know, like they have all these like porn star names to protect their, you know, real names. Well, I think in the 80s and stuff like that, a lot of 80s porn actors, you know, didn't you they just use their real names because the internet wasn't created yet and porn was on VHS and they didn't think that anyone would ever find out and here's the thing is like I respect you like if you did porn and you made money just so you could you know go to college or pay for school I respect that you know I know strippers who would strip because they wanted to go to nursing school the only thing I can think was like god those are gonna be some lucky fucking patients I tell you what I respect that so this woman's teaching English at a high school in uh, St. Mooish, you know, we'll, we'll rhyme, I, just to keep it anonymous, in Missouri. Um, and, you know, I guess the kids Google her name, and someone had put that porn up on Pornhub. Because for some reason, which I don't get, is, like, people will upload vintage porn from, like, the 70s and the 80s and put it on Pornhub. Because I guess that's, like, a fetish, you know, obviously... The fetish right now in porn is like everybody wants to hook up with their step sibling, which I, I think is really fucking weird. But, you know, some people still like to watch 80s and like 90s and 70s porn because there was a little bit of a story there. You know, there was a character arc, good dialogue. You know, nowadays I feel like the porn has just gotten really watered down and it's just like they just get straight to it on a couch in a rented hotel room. Um, so these kids must Google their teacher because I would assume a lot of kids will do that. They will Google their teacher, okay, and because they're curious and they probably do want to look up dirt. So they find out that this teacher is a porn star, okay? And the minute they find that out about her, from what I heard from some other teachers that work there, is that all the kids then really started to respect her and pay attention to her. Because all the little boys were like, I've seen you naked and now I'm like lusting for you. So I'm going to be really, really good in class because, you know, you're a porn star. I've seen you in action. You're probably very good. I'm not going to lie. I watched a little bit of the porn. She's very talented. Very talented, erotic actress. Very talented. And all the little boys are, you know, focused. They're going to pay attention. They're going to listen to every word that she says because they're just thinking about her naked, right? Like, and they're not going to joke. They're not going to make fun of her. They're not going to disrespect her because in their minds, they're like, oh, my God, like this woman could do things to me that I probably will never experience in my life. Uh, and then sadly, what happened was is that I think the school found out 
uh, months later, they found out about it because you know how kids talk, and for some reason, this is always kind of really I thought was really weird is the, is the teachers because when I was a substitute teacher. The teachers were very attuned to, like, what was going on in the school drama of, like, who was dating who, the cliques and all that. And I thought that was, like, really fucking weird. I was like, why the fuck do we give a shit about these kids' lives in this matter? Like, why do I care if Billy got a five-second blowjob during gym class? I don't care, but the teachers do. And so the teacher, you know, another teacher finds out. And I would assume this is a jealous teacher that's never done porn. And then they reported it. And this poor lady, she got fired. They fired her. Even though her porn was done in the 80s. And she did nothing bad. She did nothing bad. She made an erotic, tasteful porno. She lost her job. I think that's bullshit, by the way, um, that, that, that she lost her job. Because obviously that technique works. And that's our final technique we're going to talk about is be a porn star. Now, I'm not saying be a porn star. Listen to me now. Listen to me now. I'm saying hint at the illusion that you could be a porn star. Okay. That's kind of what you want to do, right? And I don't think this works for men. Uh, I'll say it. You know, obviously, you know, a good-looking guy comes in, doesn't work, right? And here's the thing. Like, like I said before, the real troublemakers when you're a substitute teacher, they're the boys. The girls are great. I never had a bad, like, girl student. I think I had one bad girl student and, you know, wasn't that bad. But the boys, they are awful, okay? So this scenario sadly only works if you're a woman. Um, But you know what? Now I think about it. No, now I think about it. It will work as a man. No, now I think about it, it will, because you'll have what I like to call big dick energy, okay? And let me tell you something, when you throw in that big dick energy at a middle school or high school level, kids will respect you, okay? So yeah, it does work, okay? For the female aspect of it, you know, it's, it's the sexuality, it's it's them thinking that they've seen you naked, and they've seen you in a porno, and then they're going to listen to you. Uh, on the man side, it's because, you know, they think that you're in porn and you have a ginormous, you know, ding, ding dong, I, I, I don't want to say it because this isn't a triple X rated show, but you got that big dick energy and then the kids are going to listen to you. Now, how do you create the illusion that you're a porn star? Well, I'm not going to lie. When you go to the school, you're going to have to dress a little slutty, you know, a little tight shirt for my guys, a little tight pants. If you don't have the big dick energy, you know what I'm talking about. Just put something down there to create the illusion of some, you know, big dick energy, right? Because when you walk in there and you're kind of looking good, kind of slutty good, I would say like I'm going out to a nightclub in Manhattan good and someone offers me cocaine in the bathroom. Like, does that make sense? Like you want to go to one of those nightclubs where like when you go to the bathroom, people are doing coke and they're really, really friendly and they ask you if you want to do coke. That's kind of how you want to dress. So it's like business, casual, Manhattan, cocaine, bathroom-esque. Google that. I think you'll know exactly what I'm talking about, right? But not too, too slutty. So just enough to where the kids are going to Google you, okay? Because now the kids all have cell phones. And the minute you walk in the room, they're going to Google you. And they're going to look you up. Because they want to see what kind of dirt they can find on you or use against you, right? I always feel bad, like these teachers who have TikToks. And then, you know, they post something stupid. And the kids, you know, get them fired. But if you ever have that scenario, obviously, we had an episode previously, a few episodes ago, of, you know, how to survive putting dumb stuff on your social media and not getting fired. I, I suggest listening to that episode. But how do you create the illusion that you could be a porn star? So here's what you want to do is number one, you want to go on Pornhub, and you kind of just want to find your porn star doppelganger. Like, you want to find someone who kind of looks like you. And if you can't find someone that kind of looks like you, then my advice is just start kind of looking like one of them, okay? And, you know, you might even want to change your name to kind of match theirs, but you just want to find someone that kind of looks like you. I would say height and weight, and the hair thing, you can always get a wig, same kind of facial features, You want your porn doppelganger. Also, you know, know a little bit about them, know their style. 
uh, know what they like, positions, things like that. Be a little bit familiar. You know, obviously don't stalk them. Don't get obsessed with them. I see this happen all the time. People start watching porn and then they get addicted to their porn doppelganger because their porn doppelganger is like having this amazing sex life that they wish they could always have. And then it gets like super, super weird. So don't do that. Don't do that. Okay. Obviously you don't want to do that. So when you walk in the room, obviously, because the kids will always do this. 99% of the time, the kids will always ask you about yourself or you always give an introduction. So you have to use the introduction to, to drop a hint that you used to work in porn. And so when you come in, you'd be like, you know, if I was using myself, I'd say, hey, everybody, uh, welcome to class. My name is Mr. Catelli. Uh, I'm your substitute teacher today. I'm not a teacher. I'm actually uh, an actor. I've worked on some very erotic artistic pieces. Now, see what I did there? See what I did? I hinted at erotic. And that's a key word. That's a trigger word. Because once the kids hear that, they hear erotic, their brains instantly think porn, right? They instantly think porn. Okay, so and you got to make it tasteful. And then one of the kids will ask you because they listen to those trigger words. They're going to be like, well, what do you mean erotic artistic pieces? And that's when you know you've got their interest. So they'll be like, well, Mr. Gratelli, what do you mean? Uh, what do you mean er er erotic uh, er artistic pieces? Oh, you know, I was young and I did some some erotic um, student films, you know, very tasteful, very artistic. You know, uh, we had some models, little, you know, it was nudity, blah, you know, you want to kind of hint at the nudity, right? Because once now they've heard erotic and they've heard nudity, they're going to try and find you. And they're going to try and look you up on their phones, right? But how do you make it so they connect to your doppelganger? Now, nowadays, the kids might take a picture of you and scan your face, and that's how they can, like, find you and they might find your porn doppelganger so what this is you kind of have to use the porn doppelganger's name right you're gonna have to so if like i'm nick catelli and then my porn doppelganger was like clint clitoris you know obviously you have to like let the kids know you know so they'll be like going back to our scenario the kids are like oh uh, so uh, there was nudity and i mean uh, did, did you like doing it oh yeah it was great you know i i had my art artist name i was clint clint clitter os or clitters i forget what it was uh, it was a long time ago because once they hear the the first like clitor you know they're gonna know it's clitoris right but i didn't legally say it so i can't get in trouble for saying clitoris in a class but they hear that they attach onto it now they're googling Clint Clitoris on Pornhub, boom, they see your porn doppelganger. And then they're like, holy shit, this guy used to be a porn star. Or this woman used to be a porn star. They got big dick energy, or they've got my full attention because I've seen them naked. Okay, now I know what you guys are worried about, right? I know what you guys are worried about is that the school's going to find out and they're going to fire you or you're going to get in trouble or it's going to be in the news or whatever. But guys, remember, at the end of the day, these people aren't you. They're your doppelgangers. Rookie mistake I would see in this scenario is that you actually go out and try to make your own porno. Don't do that. Do the doppelganger round because the principal is going to call you into his office and he's going to be like, uh, Mr. Gatelli, uh, uh, there's a rumor going around because I listen to what the kids are saying because I have no fucking life of my own that uh, you, 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 were, uh, uh, you were Clint Clitoris the porn star. Uh, I, I looked the video up right here and I've been watching 15 hours of it. Uh, is there anything you'd like to say? And then you're like, dude, look a little bit closer. That's not me. And then when he does, he'll be like, oh, my God, that. That, that isn't you. I, I'm terribly sorry. And you can just be like, no, no, that's okay. You know, uh, I get mistaken for a porn star all the time. Obviously, you know, you want to hold on to that big dick energy. Um, so don't like allure that you're not a porn star, but just tell them that like, oh yeah, I get mistaken for that all the time. You know, it happens. It happens all the time. Don't worry about it. But I can tell you that I'm not a porn star. You can enter my name. Obviously, look at that picture. It's not me. Because once you look at the doppelganger picture, like, and when, a, you know, obviously, like, when an adult looks at it, they're going to look at the facial features. Versus kids, they're not looking at your face. They're looking at the boobies and the dicks and the ass and the vaginas and all that stuff, okay? But, you know, an adult will look at the facial features and try to match it up, and they won't be able to. So you're protected there. And uh, 
And I think you're going to be good. So I think those are the four scenarios that I think you can use to survive being a substitute teacher. And let's review them one more time. So number one is the comedic alpha male or alpha female, you know, style. That's where you take one of the kids and make fun of them the whole time, win the class over. We're all laughing at him. Number two is the extremist, you know, like you want to use a scenario from Grand Theft Auto or an extreme movie or tell them that you used to be a kung fu fighter or MMA. But remember, in that scenario, you got to come in with an injury, right? Because you got to come in with the injury and, and fish and the kids will ask you about it and you can tell them that like, you know, you, lost, you, know, you broke your leg skydiving, whatever, okay? Scenario three is going to be the I just lost uh, my widower or my wife left me and ran off with someone and you really tug on their hearts because 90% of the time, 80% of the class probably is are, are sadly kids of divorce. And then the last technique uh, is the porn star technique, you know, allure to the fact that you possibly could be a porn star. Remember, get the doppelganger. Don't create your own porn. And I really do believe That if you stick to using one of those four methods, and you can kind of mix and match with them, you know, um, one day you could do this, one day you could do that. But just don't get too confident, because once you get too confident, the kids are going to find out that you're you're completely full of shit, and then, you know, they'll turn against you. Okay. And I'm very confident that if you use those four, one of those four techniques, that you're going to survive the day. Because that's what's, I mean, at the end of the day, that's what being... A substitute teacher is all about is just being a placeholder. You're a bookmark. You're literally an educator bookmark for the teacher that's not there. The rookie mistake is, and I see this happen all the time, is like a substitute teacher who comes in and they're actually trying to get a real teaching job. So they actually try to teach a class. And when you actually try to teach a class, you're doomed. Because these kids, they know that you're not a real teacher. They don't respect you. And the more and more you try to actually be a teacher, the more and more that they will completely destroy you. And it will happen. And it will make you depressed. And it will make you sad. So remember, when you're a substitute teacher, you're not a real teacher. You're just a placeholder. And your whole job is just to absorb all of the blows that the normal teacher would typically take and you would take all of them. And you're doing a great service to the teachers of America. So I guess my thing is, if you can't donate money to teachers and help them and give them art supplies and school supplies or you know raise money for them or be on the PTA, be a substitute teacher because that's the ultimate gift is when you can tap a teacher on the shoulder who's a little stressed out, who's on the verge of having a drinking problem, or rethinking their life on the edge of a bridge or a cliff, you can come in, you can tap them on the shoulder, and you can say, it's okay. I'm going to take your class today, and I'm going to let them just beat the complete shit out of me so you can have yourself a little me time. And that's why I think teachers get so many breaks. You know, they get like a, a spring break, a summer break, a winter break, a Thanksgiving Day break. They need those breaks. Because a teacher's mental health is so crucial to them teaching our students. Like my teacher for my son, I want to make sure that she is mentally strong, but she's well taken care of. Because it is a battle. It is a battle today with kids when you walk into the classroom. Kids have all the power now. They see things on the media. They threaten to sue you. Mommy and daddy will believe anything that their kids tell them. Their kids could come home and say that an alien spaceship came in and shot some of the kids and killed them, and the parents would believe that. The parents don't want to side with the educators or the principals anymore. They want to side with their kids because they think that their kids can do no wrong, when in reality, every day, kids do wrong by disrespecting the teacher. And if the teacher doesn't have the respect of the parent, the student will then not respect the teacher at all. So the teachers need our help. And by being a substitute teacher, you can help them. And with my four techniques, they can help you 
also. Wow, we got a little, we got a little deep today. We got a little deep today. I'm not going to lie, but 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 I really do hold this topic near and dear to my heart um, because we need substitute teachers. I honestly believe that. I honestly believe that. I know a lot of you are like, oh, this is a comedy podcast. But, but seriously, no, no. We need substitute teachers, okay? We need them. So when in doubt, be a sub. If you're lost and don't know what to do, be a sub. If you need some money and and the mafia is shaking you down for it, be a substitute teacher because we need them. I did my service. You know what? Actually, you know what? That should be a thing. You know, like in Korea, like in, in, in South Korea, and I think in Israel too, everybody has to be in the military, right? Like all the kids, like when they graduate high school or something, I think they have to be in the military for like two years. I don't know if that's right or not. Don't quote me on that. But that should be a thing in America is that everyone straight out of college before you go in your career should have to be a substitute teacher. You should have to do a mandatory two years of substitute teaching before you can like go off. Like, like it works for the military in other countries. I think you would see a huge, huge shift in discipline in the United States of America if we forced people to be a substitute teacher for two years. I really do think, I think we would see like a huge cultural shift. I think there would be definitely a a new level of understanding and respect for teachers. I really think, I think that's something we should think about. I don't know. I don't know if President Biden would ever hear me out. I don't know if I could ever make it to the floor. Maybe we start small. I'm in California. Maybe we do that in California. We require that once you graduate college, that you have to do a minimum two years of community service, of substitute teaching. And I think that'd be really good for us. I think it'd be really good for us. Because right now, I and I honestly believe this, this is my fact opinion, is that kids are just getting, and I don't know if this is just because I'm turning into like an old man and I'm like, they're, they're these, these kids today. But kids, they have no respect for teachers. They have no respect. Now, I'm not going to lie. Like, I wasn't like the best student, but I still kind of respected my teachers. Okay, now here's my fifth bonus solution if you want to survive substitute teaching is just teach the super smart class, like the AP bio college kids, like all those high school kids that, you know, are, are going to be starting off college at like a junior level. Just, you know, try and sub the really super smart kids. And I found that those kids are always the nicest because they're actually there to, you know, learn and do their own thing. That's the easy scenario. That's a very hard scenario to come by because you kind of have to have the education for it. But at the end of the day, nowadays, you can just buy a fake degree off the internet and say you went to like Harvard, Yale, and uh, some like school in another foreign country, and they probably would believe you. So I guess that's our bonus scenario. Number five is if you can't do the porn or the extreme or the divorce or the comedy, just try and shoot the sub just like the super, super smart kids because I find that those kids are usually really, really nice. And I can tell you that from experience. I've experienced it. I taught a few like English lit advanced AP classes and those kids were like super sweet and super nice. Also, I taught theater and those kids were even the best. Like my theater kids that I taught, if they're listening to my show, they were some awesome fucking students. Those kids actually almost convinced me to become a teacher. Um, but then the sad part is, is you realize, well, I don't get to teach those kids every day. I still have to deal with all these, like, shithead kids. So I didn't go down that route, thank God. Or I probably would have had a mental breakdown, and I might be doing this show, like, out of an insane asylum if they let me, you know, do a podcast. So, guys, with that, thank you for tuning in to the Nimble Urban Survivor. Again, I'm your host, Nick Catelli. Remember, like, subscribe, follow the show. Tell your friends about the show. Tell your family about the show. If you have a cat that's your only friend, Tell them to listen to the show. I feel like the vibrations of my voice, I've told, is is very soothing to cats. Remember, also, if you ever want to be a guest on the show or you have something to uh, talk about or you want to submit a topic to the show, feel free to reach out to me via my website at www.catellicomedy.com. Guys, I know there's a lot of amazing podcasts out there you could be listening to, but this is the only podcast that tells you how to save the world every episode. So thank you for listening. Have a good month, good day, good year, good something. And I will talk to you guys later. Remember, survive out there.